We're going to look at some predictions of the king in this new series. And uh, the predictions of the king, today I want to look at the predictions of the king's forerunner. Forerunner. You see, uh, this is the first Sunday of Advent, and uh, the first Sunday is usually typical about uh, the hope that we have. And the hope was given by a forerunner. And the forerunner, uh, we're going to look at Isaiah 40, because that's where he's predicted. But before we do, I want to talk about The Voice. How many have watched this program on television, The Voice? A handful. Of, oh, a few more of you are finally admitting that you watch these silly uh, TV programs. My, my, my wife likes this, so I kind of have to watch it. Uh, because she takes control of the clicker, you know what I'm talking about, the remote, and uh, that's her time, and so I, I kind of watch it. And, and it started in the year 2011. I don't know that we've missed any of them, I'll tell you the truth. And um, here, here's, here's the scene. Uh, 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 talented people, pretty talented, better than me, they get up and they sing for competition. There's four judges, the four judges, uh, uh, they... Uh, judge them, and then they pick which ones they want to coach for a final competitions. And they have these rounds where they get knocked out and all of that. But they're singing voices. But before there were the singing voices, there was the voice of the king's forerunner. I call him the voice. One of the gospels calls him the voice. The others call him a voice. But is a voice. And kind of like the, the, the voice competition, it's not singing, but it's preaching. Oh, there's not a panel of four judges, there's four gospel writers that write about them, all giving their take on what's going on. Uh, and, and you know, it's not that like the voice uh, on television, you get to call in or you text in your favorite, so you get to participate, the, the masses get to participate in it. And so it was with, with the voice, masses gathered around to which he preached, the voice was preaching. And he was the forerunner, the one picked out of all humanity to pave the way for Jesus. Wow. All four Gospels mention his voice. All four of them, I'm going to briefly hit them. I can't go over everything about the, about the voice, but we're going to hit some highlights of it today. In Luke chapter 3, it says, It is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight uh, the uh, paths for him. And John, John himself replied in, in the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, I am the voice of the one calling in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. Whew. In the book of Matthew, he says, this is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. <laughs> we go to Mark. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths for him. Listen, you say, that was a little redundant. Well, anytime the Bible tells you the same thing four times, it's like uh, if you didn't get it the first time, and you didn't get it the second time, or the third time, maybe you'd get it the fourth time. <laughs> This is an important voice, and it's all part of Advent. It's all part of Advent. It's kind of like this kicks it off. In fact, each one of the gospel writers is identifying the voice that Isaiah spoke of with John the Baptist. If I would have read the whole context of every one of those passages, the voice is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the voice. Now, regarding John the Baptist... His, his father, Zechariah, was of the Levitical line and was also of the Aaronic line, and he was actually in the temple serving when it was his turn, his course. And while he was in the temple, uh, before Jesus is ever born, uh, before John is ever born, Zechariah saw an angel, and he was startled, and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid. I just, this always cracks me up. Every time an angel appears, first thing they got to say is, don't be afraid. That tells me every artist's picture of an angel is wrong. They are these cute little chubby cherubs, right? And they're always these real feminine, good-looking ladies that got wings on them. I'm telling you, folks, that's not the way an angel looks at all. They are awesome, they are fierce, they're overpowering, they're masculine, and, and, the, and you just want to die in their presence. 
He says, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Now, I believe he was praying that he would have a son, but he's old. (laughs) Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You see, she's past the age of having kids. And you are to give him the name John. You give him the name John. We know him as John the Baptist. And he will go on before the Lord. He's going to be born before the Lord. Actually, I've read the story, and I know that the Lord is his cousin. Jesus actually is a half-cousin. Okay, he's half-cousin. Uh, he's, he's his cousin. And, and it says, and he will go before him. So he's born approximately like six, nine months before Jesus. He says, you will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Going all the way back to the book of Malachi, there's a prophecy about coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he'll turn the hearts of the father to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. And here it is. Here's his job. It's predicted this child that's going to be born is going to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John's whole task was to prepare the way for the Lord. Sometimes I think that's what our ministries are like too. Very few of us are great evangelists like Billy Graham, you know, and we, we, we don't lead a lot of people to Christ, but we plant the seeds. We, we live the life and they look at us and say, there's a Christian. They know Jesus. Now, I don't know him, but they know him, but your life is planting a seed. In Corinthians, it says, our life is an epistle read of all men. People read our lives. They read our lives. And then there's what we say. I mean, sometimes it's just a little tiny token. How many, how many got their little uh, Advent pin off the bulletin? And how many put it on already? All right, good. The whole idea is you wear that through Advent. Put it on your coat. Put it somewhere. Because that is a silent witness. A silent witness. You are sowing a seed. You're preparing people for Advent, Christmas. Okay? Sometimes it's what we say. It's just a little thing that we say. Sometimes we open up our Bibles and we say to our families, hey, before we read the night before Christmas, let's read the real Christmas story from the book of Luke. Right? John was preparing the way. That's his whole ministry. He is supposed to prepare the way for the Messiah, the Christ. We already mentioned this, but John himself, when they asked, who are you? He was out baptizing people in the Jordan River, and and finally they said, who are you? And John replied the words of, there it is, Isaiah the prophet. I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. Get right before God, please. John knew that he was fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. Even Jesus said regarding John, later in his ministry, he said, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare the way before you. John was the one preparing for me. He was putting the word out there. He was putting the word out there. He was putting the word out there. So what did Isaiah say about the voice? Since they all referred to it, I thought it would be good. If we went back to Isaiah and we were to uncover what Isaiah had actually said about the voice. Now, a few things about prophecy. All right. Prophecy in the Bible, in the Old Testament prophet, they were called seers. And they they would look and see these prophecies. And as they would see, it would be kind of like looking at a mountain range. And on the mountain range, you're you're looking towards that mountain range and, and, and you see a peak And you see another peak, and it's kind of like seeing the first coming to the prophet and seeing the second coming, and and you see them both, and and you think that they're right there on the same mountain, right? And they all look the same. But if you were to get a side view and take a look, they see the first coming, and then they see, see it going a long way to the second coming, and in between the two is a great period of time. So often in the same prophecy about the first coming, there will be something about the second coming linked in there as well because the prophet doesn't see the timing of it all. He just sees what's going to happen, what's going to go down. It's going to go down. And so we see that here with Isaiah's voice. 
the first thing we see about the voice of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40 is this. It's a comforting voice. It's a comforting voice. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. It's words of comfort. It's funny the way the gospel works. The gospel is comforting to those who believe. And it is gut-wrenching judgment to those who do not. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 40 is actually the shift between the book. The first 39 chapters are basically all about judgment. Ooh, but from 40 to 66 is all about comfort. There's something about that. You have to experience that guilt and that shame of your sinfulness and contrition and brokenness and that you need something from God before he can ever give you the comfort. You have to admit you're a sinner before you can have a Savior save you. Because if you don't admit you're a sinner, you think you're just fine. You don't need a Savior. But if I'm broken and, and I, need, I need a Savior, then I'm willing to receive the Savior. So after establishing 39 chapters of judgment, 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 he turns the corner and he says, now comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. I don't know what you've been going through, but they've been going through warfare. And so the next thing it says, and proclaim to her that her service has been completed. That's a real soft way of saying what the Hebrew really says. The Hebrew says, her warfare has ended. <laughs> I don't know what battles you've been facing. I don't know what, what hardships you've had, uh, what brokenness is there, what loss you've experienced. It could be financial, it could be physical, it could be a loved one, it could be something that you've lost. And he's saying, that time of loss is now over, the battle is over, the war has been won. So take comfort. Take comfort. Why? Here it is. That her sins has been paid for. Whoa. That's the comfort. That's the comfort. I was in my misery as a sinner, even as an eight-year-old boy. I had heard the gospel, and I knew the alternative. If you didn't have Jesus as your Savior, you'd be spending eternity in hell. Whew. Now, that's the way the gospel preacher preached it when I was a kid. And I thought of the two options. Heaven, hell. Hmm. Not a, not, not a hard no-brainer here for me. I'm going to pick heaven. I'm going to pick Jesus. And why do I pick Jesus? Because Jesus says, my sin's been paid for. My sin's been paid for. There is something very comforting in that, the fact that when I accepted Jesus as my Savior as an eight-year-old boy, I went to the camp bookstore, and I bought a Bible, a New Testament, and I bought a postcard, and I wrote home to my mom to tell her that I'd gotten saved. It's just that simple. I knew and overwhelmed me that my sins were forgiven. I was comforted by God. I was on my way to heaven. I had eternal life. It, it, that's the way it is. In fact, he goes on. The, the, John the Baptist, when he was preaching, he, he put it this way. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The sin has been paid for. And it's what the prophet sees. John is saying, hey, the, the Lamb of God is here. The payment is about to be made. He takes away the sin of the world. The war is over. I'm on the victory side. I'm on the winning side. And that she has received from the Lord, her, her, the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The Lord was more than sufficient in paying for all the debt that we owed. Wow, that's powerful stuff. The second thing we find here is that there is a desert voice. A desert voice. A voice of one calling in the desert. That term desert pops up in all four Gospels. It's very important. Because the prophecy here was that the voice is in the desert. And John the Baptist is in the desert. He's the voice crying. Now I'm driving down Route 66. And I see this sign on the side of the road. 
And I yell, because I think actually I wasn't driving. My brother was driving at the time. I go, whoa, you got to turn around and go back. He said, what? You guys missed it. You didn't see it. I said, what? I said, there's a sign. I got to take a picture of this sign. So we turn the car around, we go back. And we... I took several pictures. It says, Jesus, King of the Roads. You think Route 66 is great? Pfft, that is nothing to the highway being prepared for our God. Whoa. In fact, in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every gospel writer puts this. I am the voice, the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. John's job was to make straight the way for the Lord. Now that comes all the way out of what happened in the, the, the ancient world. He says here, Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain will be made low, and the rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a, 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 as a plain. It was customary when a king was going to go somewhere, they sent forerunners ahead, and they would make sure that the path was cleared. If there was a valley too steep, they'd have to build up a, a, a bridge to go across it. They'd have to level that out. If there was something too high, they'd send a task force. Hey, let's, let's get that thing straightened out. And they would make a path to make sure that there was a, a way to where the, the dignitary was going. John is the forerunner for the king of kings. Now, the idea here is not so much the physical, although I believe when Christ comes back, there's going to be a lot of change in the topography of the earth when Jesus returns, because I've read some of the other prophecies in the scriptures. But I believe it is, he is to make ready a people. Remember, we read that. He, so John comes along and he's preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why is the kingdom at hand? Because the king is present. So what he's doing, he's preparing, say, listen, I'm not the king, but he's here. The king is here. Jesus is here. He's trying to make the path ready for the people. And then he adds this. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. I just can't help it. My mind kind of just links these things together. In the beginning, it says in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word a name for Jesus, the Word. In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Whew. You jump down to verse 14, and it says, and the Word became flesh. That's talking about incarnation. The second person of the eternal trinity became mankind. Mary, Virgin Mary, was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit with great power, so that what was conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. And this one is God that's in her, joined with humanity. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's saying, yeah, after he was born, he lived his life. And John adds this, and we have seen his glory. Wow. And then you read several times in the Gospels about when Jesus performs a miracle, they saw the glory of the Lord. Or when Jesus raised the dead, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. John was crying out the voice, glory is coming. Now, I also noticed as I'm reading through the, the, the word that Luke renders this whole verse. He kind of paraphrases this whole verse, which gives me a commentary on what the Old Testament meant. He says, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it. But he renders it, Luke goes, does it this way. And all mankind will see God's salvation. Isn't that great? We glory in the cross. Jesus was born to die. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, right? To redeem those under the law. Listen, he was born to die. The whole point here is the glory, there's glory in the cross. And I go a little bit further and I find that Jesus talking about his own coming, second coming, he says, when the Son of Man will come in his glory, Jesus coming back in glory, and the angels with him, and he will sit on the throne in heavenly glory. In heavenly glory. John, the forerunner, he, he's not distinguishing between all these comings. 
He's just saying, glory is coming, glory is coming, glory is coming, glory is coming. Whoa. Now, the next thing I notice about the voice is that it's a forever voice. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? That's Isaiah. Hey, cry out. He said, what shall I cry? And this is what he says. All men are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. And the grass withers and the flower falls because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. So he makes a metaphor here that people are just like the grass. They spring up. They get scorching heat. They go through a couple season, uh, seasons of the spring, summer, and the fall. They're gone. Whew. That's what he says. The grass withers and the flowers fall. <laughs> That's what happens. It's gone. But then he adds this. But the word of our God stands forever. This is so important. John's voice by the Holy Spirit was recorded in the scriptures so that I still hear John's voice today. Wow. Isaiah is telling us that that message of the forerunner, John, is still the message today. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. It's a forever message. Forever and ever it is recorded in God's word. The third aspect of the voice that we find in Isaiah is it's a gospel voice. It's a gospel voice. Listen, it says, you who bring good tidings. The word good tidings is good news. That's what the word gospel means, good news. You who bring good, good tidings to Zion, go up on the high mountain. You who bring tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the town of Judah, here is your God. Wow. The gospel. God became flesh. Remember when I said that he kind of sees these things kind of all at once, the first coming, the second coming, but there's time in between. Well, it's kind of like that. The first coming is mentioned here. Here is your God. It's the incarnation. It's what we celebrate at Christmas. Every year we remember that God became flesh and he was born in a, in a stall of a manger uh, and he, he, was, he grew up. The shepherds first came and all the things that we, we celebrate at Christmas time, this is your God. At, at 12 years old, he, he's disputing with the scholars in the temple. And then at 30 years old, he's baptized and enters into ministry. He lives for three years. This is your God. This is his first coming. But then he turns in the very next verse and he says this. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. And Jesus said that he didn't come in his first coming to condemn us, but to save us, John 3, 17. He didn't come to condemn, but to save. He comes in the second coming as a mighty conquering king, and he's going to vanquish all his foes, and it says, and his arm rules for him. He takes up his rule on his throne. He says, see, even his reward is with him. Guess who that is, folks? That's all who know the Lord. We go to heaven at the rapture, and we're with Christ, and when he returns, we return with him. His reward, that is you and I are with him, his recompense accompanies him. We come back with him. Listen, he'll set up a kingdom for a thousand years. This, this voice is also pastoral. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. He's talking about once he comes, he sets up his kingdom. During that setting up of the kingdom, it says, he will put the sheep on his right hand, and the king will say to those on his right hand, come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Jesus is going to shepherd his flock through the millennium, and we're going to be there with him to shepherd that flock too. 
This is what I want you to take with you today. As we look at this passage about Advent and making preparations for Advent, the voice is still crying out today from the Word. Prepare, be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Be prepared. Except that the Lamb of God has come and he has already bled and died and paid and bought and the war is over. He's won. You need to receive that. And so that's what you need to do. Receive him into your life. For as many as received him into their lives, it says in, in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, he gave them the authority to be called the children of God. Whew. You accept Christ as your Savior, become a child of God. He says, listen, the voice is still crying out, prepare for his second coming. Jesus is coming back. He says, be like John while you're still here, a voice in our wilderness, telling people as they're struggling in their brokenness and the hardships of life, give them the words of comfort. Jesus came to rescue you just as he came to rescue me. Be a voice just like John in the wilderness. Let's pray. Father, on this first Sunday of Advent, as we reflect upon the preparation that was made for our Savior, how you raised up John, you've raised us up just like him to be a voice to someone. Someone today, someone this week, someone who is broken and hurting, someone who's suffered loss and who needs comfort. And we can say, hey, listen, the war is over. Jesus has already paid the debt. Receive Christ and find the comfort that only God can give. Lord, I pray that we will be that voice. And in this Advent season, we will touch other people's lives with the good news that Jesus has already won our battle. We are on the winning side. And that the other person who doesn't know Christ can be there too. Just accept him. Help us to be that voice, Lord. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.